Melissa mentioned, uh, my name is James R. Diaz. I'm a Associate Professor of History here at USF and direct the Uchenko Philippine Studies Program, uh, which is one of the few, very few Philippine Studies programs at a four-year university in the United States. And um, tonight, we're going to have a, a nice casual conversation uh, to talk about um, a very serious film uh, and documentary, A Thousand Cuts. And I think uh, many of you saw the documentary um, prior to hopping on this uh, webinar tonight. And so hopefully, um, if you've seen the documentary, you can follow along with us. If you've not, uh, we really do recommend uh, you taking some time to watch. It's really powerful, um, really timely, and something that um, is unfortunately something that we're still struggling with today in the Philippines and even here in the United States, which is around questions around uh, freedom of the press, information, disinformation, um, threats to democracy, and what have you. So there's a lot to talk about. Um, so I want to turn it over to Professor Coronel and just kind of start off and uh, kind of ask you, you know, since you're a consultant in the film and also someone that is obviously paying a lot of attention to what's going on in the Philippines, uh, particularly recently, um, can you tell all of us maybe a little bit about, you know, who um, Rodrigo Duterte is, but more so of why is he popular? and among many Filipinos, but also not popular <laughs> among many Filipinos, and maybe talk a little about the war on drugs as a little bit of context, because that was a, obviously one of the underlying themes of the documentary was addressing um, his popularity, his ascension, his rise, but also in relation to the war on drugs. Um, Rodrigo Duterte, oh, thank you. And welcome. Um, thanks everyone for inviting me here. And uh, I guess it's still early early evening to most of you. I'm, I'm here in New York, it's, um, it's 9 p.m. here, but good evening, good morning, wherever you are. So Rodrigo Duterte assumed, uh, was elected to the presidency of the Philippines in 2016, but before that, he was for over 20 years, mayor of Davao City in Mindanao in the Southern Philippines. He gained fame or notoriety, depending on, on what you think for for bringing uh, for using the iron fist to bring law and order to his his native city Davao City, Davao in the 1980s was a laboratory for insurgency and counterinsurgency. There were almost daily killings. It was known as the murder capital of the Philippines. When Duterte became president shortly after the fall of Ferdinand, uh, became became mayor of Davao in 1988, so two years after the People Power Revolution ousted Ferdinand Marcos, he was largely credited in, in restoring peace and order in Davao. But he did that using really um, iron-fisted iron methods. He is said to be the founder and patron of the Davao Death Squad, which are secret assassination squads. They were hitmen that targeted petty criminals, street children, and sort of the underworld of Davao society targeted them for assassination, usually by motorcycle riding gunmen. Um, in the last 10 years of his mayoralty there, they say about human rights groups say something like 1400 people were killed by the Davao death squad. That was the price that the people of Davao had to pay for peace and order. So Duterte basically rose to power on the promise that he would bring, he would rein in criminality, bring back peace and order to a city that had been racked both by insurgency and criminality. And it was this same appeal that he used to um, get votes for his 2016 run for the presidency. The Philippines has a broken justice system. The courts are compromised, the police are corrupt. And so Duterte broached a kind of vigilante type of justice. And he said, you know, you can't trust law enforcers to rein in crime, to, you know, drug addiction is a, is a big problem in the Philippines. And he said, you can't trust these traditional politicians and the governments you voted into power before to resolve these problems. So he appealed to, you know, the desire for law and order, a desire that's not unique to the Philippines. I mean, in, in the US, as you know, many US presidents 
and many local officials got to power by saying, well, they'll tamp down on crime. Duterte was no different. Perhaps the, the difference was his willingness to use extrajudicial killings as a and summary executions uh, to rein in street level crime. And it was on that basis that, that he won power. And this kind of vigilante thinking, the thinking that if you follow the law, you will never solve this problem, that the courts are too slow, that judges can be uh, that can can be bought off, that law, you can always get smart lawyers to get you off the hook. This general dis unhappiness and frustration with the slow pace of justice basically led to Duterte's popularity up to now, despite you know, thousands of, of killings in the wake of his anti-war, anti-drug and anti-crime campaign. Thank you, Sheila, for providing that context. I think it's really important uh, for folks, especially if you're not um, closely keeping an eye on what's going on in the Philippines. You know, I think for a lot of us in the room, you know, presumably a lot of us are living in the United States. I mean, it feels we're, like we're removed from what's going on there. But there are a lot of, you know, I couldn't help but draw parallels, and I still draw parallels between what's going on in the Philippines with the rise of Duterte and Duterteism, if you want to call it. And what we recently had here in the United States with Trump and Trumpism, although Trumpism has not quite quote unquote died away, um, that that kind of populist hardcore right uh, sentiments are still here. I I'm curious to know if you also think, um, and since this was part of the theme, one of the themes of the movie is part of Duterte's rise is also because of the, the ways in which social media and the internet played a role in not only um, making him be seen as a as a uh, as a viable candidate running for the presidency and to take over Malik and Yang, but also thinking about how this kind of um, how people have been taking matters in their own hands, using social media and using the and using the dirt as a reason to engage in violence um, in the name of also the war on drugs. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Because clearly, in the documentary. They talk about that and the popularity of bloggers like Mocha Uson and, and also just kind of Facebook and Twitter and all of the disinformation. I'm just kind of curious what you think, um, how does social media play a role in all this? Um, and is it also not only, if you will, informing this campaign on the war on drugs, but also is it a potential threat to um, Philippine democracy and Philippine politics and day-to-day -day life? What are your what are your thoughts on that? Duterte is the first Philippine president to master social media. You know, he really is a social media president. In part, that was because he started out with not having very much money in his campaign. So traditionally, presidential candidates bought a lot of television ads and television was the main avenue for um, winning over voters. But Duterte made realize the importance of Richard and his men and, and his people realized the importance of social media early on, much earlier than the other candidates for the presidency. And it was also, they made a virtue out of necessity. In effect, they decided that they couldn't fight uh, the, the amounts of money that were being spent on television advertising, that they would do it through social media. And they came at the right time because um, Philippines is one of the biggest users, particularly of Facebook um, in the world. And Facebook launched, you know, the free Facebook. Basically, they allowed cell phone, mobile phones. So Filipinos go into the internet not using their computers. They basically log on using mobile phones, um, partly because the landline technology was very slow. The rollout of, of landlines has been very slow in the Philippines. And so the Philippines sort of leapfrogged from landlines direct into mobile phones. So starting around the early 2000s, mobile phones became ubiquitous. Nearly every Filipino owns a mobile phone. And it is through the mobile phone that Filipinos access the internet. And Facebook provided free access to its service. Um, to And it, they rolled this out in several countries, including Myanmar and everything. And that 
basically uh, Duterte took advantage of this social media infrastructure to uh, propagate his campaign message, which is basically go tough on crime, um, you know, this take no prisoners approach. Basically, he hyped criminality and drug addiction as a problem. Previous to this, previous to Duterte, all the polls show that Filipinos thought that the main problem was jobs and food and livelihood. It was not crime. But because Duterte was so effective in changing the terms of the discourse and making Filipinos think about crime as the problem, not just as a problem, as the existential threat to their livelihood and to Philippine democracy, basically using social media and social media influencers like Moka Uson and several others. So he changed the terms of the debate and that partly accounted for his, for his presidency and later his consolidation of power because social media was used not only to propagate what you may call as Dutertismo, it was also used to harass his enemies, put down rivals, demonize independent media, which has, which you know, for a long time in the Philippines for decades, and you can say throughout Philippine history, has been the watchdog of power. He's basically tried to delegitimize them by saying they are tools of the elite, that they are paid, and that they are prostitutes. And it's interesting he coined that term. I don't know, they use that in India as well as, as, well as in other countries. But the use of social media to counter mainstream media, not just to propagate um, the ideology and, and, and the programs, the anti-crime and the sort of violent ideology of, of, of Duterte. They also used it to crack down on dissenters and to undermine the legitimacy of the Philippine press. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really, troubling and and scary you know frankly to as you're watching a thousand cuts and all you know a lot of you in the in the room have watched it have seen it um I, I just really was struck by how I mean I knew as well like many of us in the room know how popular Facebook is used in the Philippines but the way in which it's a source of mobilization um and again spreading of of wrong false information um, and also how it's also launched careers in many ways of people like Moka Uson, like um, Bato de la Rosa, right? All, all the other um, surrogates that uh, are, are part of this kind of Duterte orbit. And it, it just, to me, it's really quite fascinating to see the power of the cult of personality and, and how Duterte has moved beyond his policies and politics and has become a, a, a more of a, a cultural figure for many people. And I think that's what is so um, troubling. And I'm quite curious to know, I mean, this is something we quite maybe not be able to answer tonight is, you know, how long will this last? You know, for those in the audience who don't know, Philippine presidents serve a six year term. So he still has another year, right? I think till next June, is that right? So there's still another year or so of, of Duterte in Malacanang, and I'm wondering if others are going to ride his coattails, and if so, what's that going to look like, and will this continue to have a life beyond his presidency? Well, uh, Duterte is paving the way for his daughter to succeed him, and so he, his whole philosophy of governance, his strong-armed anti-crime, anti-communist rhetoric is likely, his daughter has basically replicated the same policies that her father implemented when he was mayor of Davao. So if his daughter wins it, it's going to likely use the same kinds of mechanisms, the same framework. So let me just say that a lot of what was spreading in Facebook was not spontaneous. Um, Duterte had a troll army that was spreading disinformation, using fake accounts, using, you know, using a lot of the affordances of social media platforms to basically attempt to manipulate public opinion. The irony is, you know, Facebook is, was where Rappler first appeared, right? Rappler first, first experimented with the notion of 
an independent sort of digital news site by, by going into Facebook. So Facebook can be used as well um, by independent media. It is being used by independent media. The problem is that face, what Facebook optimizes is conflict, it's shareability, it's violent language. You know, we know what sells, we're journalists. Mm -hmm. You know, if it leads, it bleeds. We know that, that's from the tabloid era. Uh, we don't need Facebook to tell us that. But Facebook basically is able to use, you know, algorithms and computational methods to know what will appeal to people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the kind of messaging that Duterte and his and his troll army and his social media supporters who takes advantage of what Facebook optimizes, which is a lot of emotion, especially anger, especially conflict, violent language. They know what people want to share. They appeal to sort of the lowest common denominator of human behavior. And Duterte knows how to do that and with the help of Facebook, he's able to propagate his message much more than, say, more rational, more compassionate, more reasoned voices. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. so, so Facebook does provide a service, but its algorithms prioritize a certain kind of shareability that Duterte and his people have been able to take advantage of. Yeah, I hear that also as well with WhatsApp. Right? I mean, there are multiple platforms too that it's beyond even just Facebook. And it really is, I'm glad you mentioned that point. It's the algorithms, it's kind of all these other factors and, and people that we don't see, <laughs> right? Uh, and know to exist. Uh, I, you know, you mentioned Rappler and I think this would be a great time kind of to segue a little bit about that because, you know, Maria Ressa, who's, you know, obviously the, the center figure of this documentary founded um, Rappler. And I want to know maybe a little bit about, um, you know, if you know, why was Rappler founded? Maybe a little bit of backstory about uh, what this platform is for those who don't know. Um, and why has it been such a target of the, of the Duterte administration and Duterte supporters? Because clearly, you know, Rappler has been at the forefront of a lot of, of pretty um, um, uh, hard hitting, stories about the administration, right? And so Maria uh, Oresa and also, um, uh, I can't remember, uh, Pia Renata, right? Also at the, at the center of a lot of the kind of public um, anger, at least from those who support Duterte. So maybe could you tell us about Rappler and why it's been seen as an agitator to the administration rather than being seen as a, a watchdog of what's going on behind the scenes? Well, Rappler was founded in 2011. It became a full-fledged, as I said, it's a Facebook page, became a full-fledged website in 2012. So it's a di digital native publication. It's like Buzzfeed. It's like of the other media outfits you see, not just in the US, but all around the world and serving mainly an urban millennial audience. So it, it's, it's articles where, you know, not using the formal language of, of you know, the very um, what formal English that mainstream news, legacy news organizations use. They were very much present in social media. They believed in interactivity, in audience engagement. So like a lot of, you know, like a lot of the digital native news sites, you know, they were very much in touch with their audience. They, they, um, they created for, for us and mechanisms for the audience to talk back to them. So they, they were also very experimental using, you know, many, uh, you know, using data, using graphics, using all sorts of things, using multimedia to be able to tell stories in a new way. Since they were free from the burden, like a lot of legacy news organizations, from the burden of having to have a regular newsroom with printed presses or broadcast stations, they could be more nimble, more experimental. And so they did get a young millennial, mostly urban English speaking audience that is very influential in, in the Philippines. Their problem started when Duterte took over and they started doing the same thing that they had done in the past, which was doing you know, critical watchdog reporting, holding power to account. They did stories on the drug war. They did stories on corruption in government. They did stories on 
troll armies that Duterte was unleashing. And that earned Duterte's ire because Duterte had was clamping down before Rapper, it was clamping down on the inquirer and initiate his government initiated a tax audit of the inquirer. It clamped down on later on after after uh, after Rappler, it clamped down on ABS-CBN. So in effect, Duterte sees independent media as threats to his power and treated them as the enemy rather than as, you know, traditionally been in the Philippines, there's been some tolerance of the role of the, of the press and mm -hmm. of journalists in questioning power. Duterte didn't believe in that. And so they got into trouble. Uh, Maria Reza got, you know, death threats. She got trolled by the army up to now. Uh, Pia Raniada, the reporter covering the presidential palace, was barred from the presidential palace, basically for doing what journalists have always done in the Philippines. Many news organizations decided to self-censor and to tone down their reporting uh, in order not to anger the president. But, but Rappler and later ABS Inquiry, ABS even didn't do that. Rappler hasn't folded, as they say, you know, they hold the line in terms of being an independent watchdog of power. Yeah, I, I'm actually, you know, it's interesting to me how many times Rappler had been under threat and that they've sustained themselves considering how much uh, online vitriol they've received. And, and I, watching the documentary, I, I, it was nice to see the, how that played out in the last couple of years. And you see, just mentioned, uh, you know, Sheila, you know, ABS-CBN was shut down. It's still shut down to my knowledge, it's right? Still, it's still shut down, yeah. It's shut down. And yeah. that's a main source of not only news, but entertainment in the Philippines and globally for those in the, a part of the Philippine diaspora, a lot of programming comes from ABS-CBN. Yeah. Uh, in fact, one of the journalists in the documentary who was interviewing um, uh, Bato was uh, ABS-CBN reporter. So, um, I wanted to know if you could, uh, Sheila, if you can speak on this. Um, you know, I can't help but I'm a historian, and and knowing your background, are there parallels or or similarities between what is going on now with Duterte and not even just how he governs, but also his relationship with the media, and let's say Marcos, President Marcos, in in the in during the martial law years, especially in the in the seventies and eighties. You know, do you, is there something that's more of a, a, a much more grave threat or is this something we've seen before? I mean, what are your just kind of initial thoughts on this? Because, you know, I, I, I can, I think a lot of us can't help but see similarities between these two figures, granted very different generations, but ones in which there's some repetition in how they behave and their relationships with, um, with the media in particular. Well, all authoritarian leaders, regardless of where they are, always try to control the press and restrain the press because they do not want their regimes to be questioned because they want to be able to have full control because they want to stay in power, right? And they don't, and the way to stay in power is to suppress all criticism and, and all exposure of the wrongdoing of wrongdoings of government. So in that sense, there's a similarity. And, and even you know, other presidents in between, Marcos and Duterte, tried to do that to a certain extent. What makes it different was that Marcos closed down all newspapers, all TV stations, and all the radio when he declared martial law in 1972. And when the media was allowed back, it was limited to just you know, three daily newspapers in Manila, uh, three major TV networks. So it was the control was through ownership and through licensing. So you couldn't own a TV network if you were anti Marcos. The difference with Duterte is he tries to do that, controlling, restricting the flow of information, but also flooding the information space with disinformation, using social media networks, using mainstream media, using radio, radio as a uh, as a mode of disinformation is under understated. We know about social media because we can see it, we can measure it, but not radio. So there's a difference. Before it was the main tactic was restricting information. In this new era, authoritarian leaders use flooding with disinformation as a main tactic for suppressing independent, independent, independent fact-based news. That's right. And it's and it's supporters yeah. who are also um, perpetuating 
this information or disinformation out there, right? I think that's the scale, the volume. It's how do you how do you control the internet, right? Um, in in such a way, and I think that's what in some ways is frankly a bit more pernicious and scary. Um, is that and then this is not certainly a new problem. We've seen this in the last five or six years, in particular, uh, in the Philippines and here. Uh, I, I want to kind of, you know, relatedly ask you a little bit about what your thoughts are on how, what the, of the focus of Maria Ressa in the film and how she's dealing with all of this. Um, what did you think about how the documentary covered that? I thought it was actually quite interesting too, to kind of get, especially I think it was more in the middle or towards the end of the film, seeing the kind of more backstory of who Maria is herself. And I thought that was a nice way to kind of humanize her rather than just see her as this martyr and, and, and kind of public figure, you know, Times Person of the Year and, and what have you, but see her and, and understand that she lived and lives in some ways a transnational life. You know, she has a U.S. connection. She went to high school here. She went to university here. But she said she chose to make the Philippines her home despite her uh, ties to the United States. And so I wanted to hear, you know, since you were a consultant on the film and just as someone that is familiar with all of this, you know, what do you think of, of that element of the documentary? You know, I thought that was actually somewhat surprising um, to kind of see that's that slice inside of her life and how her personal and family life plays a role in in her crusade and the crusade of everyone that's trying to defend the media and the press and and you know uh, and other questions around philippine democracy i i think it was an important part of the documentary because you know we do not really know the toll that all of this trolling and all of this misinformation, all of this violent language takes on individual journalists. And I think Maria having gone through that sort of dramatizes at a very personal level, the emotional cost, not just on her, but on her family and her colleagues, that such, you know, you, you think it's all harmless, right? Because, you know, you have this tweets, you have this Facebook post, they don't really hurt you physically. But I think we underestimate the emotional and mental toll that this information and digital attacks take on individual journalists. Um, anyone who's been subjected to, to that can tell you that it, it's, it, it's very personally destabilizing. And so, bringing in Maria's personal story is, is an important one, I think, because you think of Rappler not just as a news organization, as a media institution, but it's also made up of people. Right? The, the, in a way, you know, Maria and Rappler were navigating uncharted territory. We've never been here before. We can deal, we know how to deal with physical threats. You know, we know how to deal with newspapers being closed, with censorship. But dealing with this information at a very personal level, the kinds of attacks leveled against Maria are about her looks, her origins, everything. But, you know, right to the core of her being, we've never had that before. Because in the past, individual journalists were attacked, you know, for what they wrote, not for who they are. Mm -hmm. and, and in a way that is much more difficult and much more difficult also for people outside to understand uh, why are you making such a big deal about this, right? You're still alive, right? Um, you're still publishing, you're still out, you're still out, you're speaking internationally, but, but I think a uh, thousand cuts makes people understand the, the, what do you call it, the cost mm -hmm. at a very personal level, the cost of this, their dysfunctional disinformation system on real humans, on real individuals. Right. No, absolutely. I think, you know, I, I, it was so um, difficult to watch uh, the ways in which, you know, not even just Maria, but also Pia and others who work at Rappler, the, the, the scale of misogyny, um, the scale, how personal and, and, and um, nasty 
things are. And that's, that is the internet, unfortunately, and that's internet culture and the trolls. And this is not necessarily specific to the Philippines, but to see it, to see it used in such a way that is supposedly, you know, rooted in, you know, policy, right? People say, you know, like, oh, we're in this, this is for the war on drugs, but you're going to go ahead and attack, you know, a journalist whose, whose job really, and in, 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 in interest is for, presumably for the greater good. Um, and I think that's what is, I think, one of the most um, um, compelling themes of the documentary is to kind of think through, you know, what, what do we gain and what do we lose from um, having our public figures, our politicians, our leaders engage with the internet, right? How do they use the information and tactics um, to get their agenda done, whatever that may be? And I think the way in which Duterte has, has spun, right, uh, the issue of drugs, which is a problem in the Philippines, to make it seem as though that's the number one issue, it, it just really is um, just really troubling all around. Uh, and I think the documentary does a nice job of trying to convey that in some ways, a lot of this is very much, I don't want to say fabricated, that's too strong a word, but it's been exaggerated, right, uh, to levels because of the internet and the fandom that Duterte has, uh, you know, I, yeah, I think that there's something to be said about that. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, we have a, a bit more time here before I want to turn it over to Q and A. Um, you know, Professor, you were a consultant on this film. Could you tell us a little bit about, you know, um, how you um, became part of helping put this movie together and and why you, you chose to get involved and, and, and lend your expertise and knowledge to this film. Because I think, you know, for a lot of us who don't know much about what's going on in the Philippines right now, this was a, nine, a, a, a wonderful way, really insightful film to kind of get a sense of the political, cultural and digital landscape as well. So can you tell us about how you got involved with the documentary and, and what was the experience like for you? Well. I, I first met Ramona Diaz, who is the director of this documentary, I think around 2018, around 2019, when we organized a conference on Duterte at Columbia University. So we brought in people from the Philippines, but also people, scholars from around the US and, and, and uh, Ramona was there. And her first idea was to do something about the drug war in the Philippines. But when she came back, and also because so many other people had done that, and she went there, she she also realized the role of the media in in co in covering the drug war. And so she pivoted, going from and I introduced her to Maria and some of the rapper people. And she pivoted from there, from a, a film that was originally supposed to be on the war on drugs to making it about Rappler. And then the elect 2019 elections um, came. And so that was great. She was there. And so it, it looked at the whole, you know, both how populism works, but also about the resistance to populism and how the media has somehow been at the front lines of that resistance. So that's how the film story evolved. And I basically just had conversations with Maria, I, I had no hand in the shooting or anything, but basically just had conversations with her about what was going on in the Philippines. Thank you so much uh, for that. I, yeah, I, I think, you know, it's, I, with this documentary, I think what I hope that all of us who watched it as well, and if you haven't watched it again, please do take some time. Thankfully it's streaming um, uh, on the internet right now, on PBS, through YouTube and whatnot, all, all the platforms out there. I, what I hope this does is really open up a conversation about um, the urgency about the relationship between the internet, social media, and democratic governance around the world. Um, that this is not necessarily something that is specific to the Philippines, that this is a global international problem. Um, and the digital ecosystem and, and the landscape that we're dealing with today is is a threat to these questions around governance and um, and and access to information and what have you. You know, I think one of the parts of the movie, for example, that always stood out, stood out to me is kind of how was it Rappler? I think it was Pia, right? That was kind of pushed out or kicked out of Malik and Young, and and I mean that's such a significant moment because I think in many ways, you know, that really is a kind of 
indicative of how much these leaders think about and respect journalists and journalists, um, which are which is essential to um, to how politics um, operates and thrives. Right. So I want to um, thank you so much for for chatting with us. I want to actually turn the floor over now to some questions I received.